Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this special webinar with Dr. Jeff Volick. We're talking managing your energy on a low-carb diet, a topic that's had uh, quite a bit of interest um, as we are in uh, perhaps the second low-carb revolution here over the last uh, couple of years. Um, and no better person to join us today than uh, Dr. Volick, who's had uh, a whole bunch of experience um, in the low-carb world. Um, in, in the research world as well. Jeff, thanks so much for uh, for giving up some of your time today to uh, to share your knowledge. Really appreciate it. Yes, hi, Varun. Um, thank you for organizing this time to talk about low-carb diets. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Jeff, uh, before we uh, dive into this, I uh, would love to have you share, um, you know, what kind of intrigued you about researching and, and studying low-carb diets. Uh, you, you've been doing this, um, you know, for 15 plus years now, but how did you enter this world and, and why was it so fascinating to you? Yeah, I'll give you uh, a very short cliff note version, but I, you know, I started out in dietetics in, in college and was always fascinated by nutrition growing up as an athlete trying to optimize my performance and decided to go into dietetics uh, with an interest in sports nutrition. But at that time I was well, you know, versed in all the virtues of high carb diets and you know, was basically uh, fatophobic, like most people uh, were and continue to be. Uh, so that was my mindset going into dietetics uh, in the early 90s. And I, you know, I think it was sometime around 1992 or three that I um, decided to experiment with a low carb diet. And I don't recall exactly why. I think I may have read the Atkins book, uh, and I don't even remember what expectations I had. I thought, I, you know, I think I would probably thought I'd feel pretty awful on that type of diet, but in fact, it was exactly the opposite. Uh, I, um, you know, I, I got leaner, I had more energy, I was less bloated, and it just, uh, you know, just fascinated me uh, how that could be because it went against everything I was being taught um, in school. Uh, so um, that really, you know, led me down this huge rabbit hole. Uh, I just became obsessed uh, with trying to understand the science of low carb diets and what was happening and you know that led me into graduate school and eventually into a PhD program and a dissertation that involved uh, studying ketogenic diets and you know really into a research career that has gone on now for almost 20 years of you know consistent interest in ketogenic diets and you know I'm still fascinated by how humans adapt and respond to very low carbohydrate ketogenic diets and we have so much to learn yet but uh, we're also at the same time uh, uh, you know we've learned a lot in the last 15 20 years in terms of uh, you know what uh, what these types of diets can do for folks and Jeff just to uh, give a, a little folks a, a little more of your background to folks in the audience I'll, I'll share some of that um, you know Jeff currently is a registered dietitian and professor in the Department of Human Sciences at Ohio State University. Um, he spoke about, you know, kind of his interest in, in low-carb diets and, and some of the research he's done. Uh, but uh, Dr. Volek, he's been invited to lecture on his low-carb research over 200 times at scientific and industry conferences in a dozen countries. And his scholarly work includes 300-plus peer-reviewed scientific manuscripts, as well as five books, uh, including a New York Times bestseller. So clearly, uh, Jeff has done a lot of work in this area and really we feel lucky to have Jeff on today sharing some of his expertise so let's dive right into it uh, you know the topic today is managing your energy on a low-carb diet and uh, to sort of set the tone for what we're going to talk about over the next uh, 45 minutes or so uh, we, we want to start with um, Jeff's perspective on who really can benefit from a low-carb diet um, from there we'll transition into what are common challenges people face when going low-carb uh, as well as some strategies people can use to have success managing energy levels when going low carb. This is something certainly Jeff will touch, down, a touch on, which is a challenge that people face, but certainly a challenge that Jeff has some good uh, uh, strategies to, to fix, if you will. Uh, and then finally, uh, we'll end the discussion with uh, discussing a little bit about why you can super starch is a really unique carbohydrate that actually fits into the low carb philosophy. And uh, we will have... Um, Seth Bronheim, registered dietitian from UCAN, sharing a, a little bit of perspective on people, uh, how people have had success going low carb and, and where they've been able to strategically implement UCAN. Um, so Jeff, let's start um, really with that, that first area. Um, who can benefit from a low carb diet? Uh, you know, is this something that, that really can be applicable to, to folks with all sorts of different 
health or fitness goals? Yeah, the the short answer to that is is pretty much everyone can adapt to a low carb diet and potentially benefit from it. And this really goes back to our our you know our ancestors and 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 really from an evolutionary perspective, uh, it's important to point out. And people may not appreciate this, but when you look at human history. Uh, probably 98% of the, that time period that humans have, have been on this planet, uh, they ate a relatively low carbohydrate diet. So we've evolved to um, be able to maintain very good health um, on virtually no carbohydrates. It's only been since the agricultural revolution, which um, you know is perhaps 10,000 years ago, and in some regions. Um, you know, a thousand or even less uh, uh, time that we've had exposure to a lot of more carbohydrate. So, you know, our bodies are very um, well suited to not just surviving, but I would argue thriving on a low carbohydrate diet. And what I mean by that is we all have the hardwiring. Uh, we all have the, you know, software program, if you will, to process um, fat and and burn fat for fuel in the in in the face of very little carbohydrate availability so it's is a very well conserved trait that we all have in terms of you know actually doing quite well in terms of maintaining energy levels and interorgan fuel exchange when we don't have a lot of carbs in the diet now you know the question of who benefits from it um you know there are people that process carbs very healthy uh, people who are more insulin sensitive and carb tolerant um, can maintain very good health with high carbohydrate diets. But, you know, right now in the U.S., over half of us are carb intolerant or insulin resistant. And so it's those people in particular that actually benefit the most, or you might say need the low carb diet the most, uh, because the people who are insulin sensitive or carb tolerant. Uh, they have more options. They can do fine on low carb or high carb, uh, and 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 the insulin resistant folks don't do well on high carb, and they're the ones that really benefit the most and need it the most. But that's not to say, um, you know, a carb sensitive person can't follow a low carb diet and still uh, extract benefit from it. In in your opinion, Jeff. Um why are low carb diets once again uh, gaining popularity? Uh, you know, we went through the first low carb revolution with the popularity of the Atkins diet uh, a couple decades ago. What is so intriguing to folks um, about low carb diets again now? Well, I think there's a couple things. Um, you know, one is people are just dissatisfied. Um, they're frustrated um, that you know they've been told to restrict fat for almost four decades now and for many folks it's you know it's been ineffective and you know and counteract and counterproductive in, 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 in most people and, and you know people continue to gain weight and become more diabetic as a result of um, you know actually doing what what they've been told so I think there's just a level of frustration uh, and, and people are looking for alternatives and increasingly they're looking at um, low carb diets and and that's for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, I'd like to think one of them is that the science continues to support them. Uh, you know, there was a lot of really great work done back in the 60s uh, and, and even prior to that, but that all really stopped in the 70s, and that coincided with the, uh, you know, the first dietary guidelines and in this diet heart hypothesis that was really taking over uh, nutrition policy in this country. And that really put the brakes on any research uh, and any policy that would promote a low carb diet. And you know that went on all the way, you know, really to to current times. But in about 2000, you know, a, a group of a small group of researchers, including myself, really started to uh, investigate the low carb diet again. And that's really continued to grow year after year. So we've got about a decade and a half, almost two decades of consistent research that's been done on low carb diets and people might be surprised I mean we're talking now about you know not two or ten studies that have been published but literally hundreds of studies that um, you know for the most part have shown positive results of low carb diets 
especially for weight loss and management of insulin resistance and diabetes, but also in other clinical applications and even a few studies now being done uh, showing benefit for athletes and sport performance. So is it safe so to it's say a, uh, it's a critical mass of, of research now. It's not a you know it's not a you know a theory anymore or a strange or unorthodox hypothesis. This is really an evidence based approach. I was going to say uh, you uh, sort of answered that, but just as a follow up to that, um, you know a lot of what was being hypothesized when when low carb diets first gained popularity. Is it safe to say that uh, you know a lot of what was being hypothesized has been borne out by the significant amount of research that's been done in the last 15 years? Well, well, yes, and, and also the corollary to that is a lot of the um, research trying to support the low-fat approach, um, you know, has not played out. And so you have, you know, kind of this lack of validation of the low-fat paradigm, and at the same time you have uh, – just a, a, a burgeoning body of literature supporting the low-carb approach. So let's dive into Jeff, this, Jeff. Uh, w w people going on a low-carb diet, first of all, I know that that has sort of been a, a term that, that's been generalized. Um, from, from your perspective, when we're discussing a low-carb diet, what does that mean, um, you know, whether it's numerically uh, in terms of grams of carbs per day or, or, or however you define it, what is your definition of what a low carb diet means. Yeah, that's a great question, Veron. And you know, there are no accepted formal definitions in the scientific or medical community on what constitutes a low carb diet. Um, you know, I like to think of it, you know, on a personal level, um, you know, and, and define it, you know, in different ways or operationally define it um, in different ways based on a person's individual response. So I might define a a low carb diet is a, a carb level below which a person's able to maintain normal blood sugar or maintain uh, or, or you know minimize or eliminate symptoms of metabolic syndrome uh, and that really v does vary from person to person because one person may be able to maintain um, good health on you know a level of carbs that uh, you know, is equal to 200 grams. Another person who's highly insulin resistant may need to consume less than 50 grams in order to to keep metabolic syndrome at bay. So, you know, that brings it, you know, to the level of the individual, which is really where we, you know, we need to 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 go in 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 terms of personalizing diet prescription. Uh, people vary widely in how they respond to carbohydrates, in particular, and. Uh, and and I'd like to think of it in those terms. Uh, so so in that you know regard, there is no magic number um, that defines a low carb diet or even a ketogenic diet. It uh, you know it's based on an operational definition that uh, you know each person needs to figure out themselves. So with that, uh, it's it's a great perspective to hear that from you. You know the the primary objective uh, in a low carbohydrate diet is really to control blood sugar. I guess the next question would be why should we care about controlling blood sugar? You know a lot of people might hear blood sugar control and, and perhaps only think of it in the context of somebody with diabetes you know but but why should the everyday individual um, really really be uh, you know critically thinking about controlling their own blood sugar? Well, you know, I think chronically um, high blood sugar is is consistently linked to increased risk for a variety of different chronic diseases, not just diabetes, but heart disease and cancer as well. So, you know, number one, the data uh, are pretty strong and, and consistent in in showing a higher risk of of morbidity and mortality associated with higher blood sugar. But I think uh, also just on a more acute level the chronic or the acute uh, elevation of blood sugar uh, often is followed by an acute um, you know decrease or, or hypoglycemic episode so you just end up with a very uh, inconsistent fuel flow uh, within the body that um, is associated with periods of fatigue throughout the day and, and so just this inconsistent um, you know source of fuel for the brain and other tissues uh, is not associated with you know long-term health or um, 
consistent energy levels throughout the day. How do you normally uh, suggest people going about figuring out uh, figuring out how many carbs they personally need? Uh, and you know, perhaps the, the best example also might be how, how did you go about doing it for yourself? Yeah, again, that, that's a great question. There's no simple answers here. I think everybody has to kind of go on their own journey. Um, but one, you know, one approach um, is to kind of go full on cold cold turkey and cut out the majority of carbs and and enter into a state of nutritional ketosis and and you know and that is really epitomizes the you know how you um, switch fuel sources from emphasizing carb oxidation to really maximizing the body's ability to burn fat for fuel so um, you know that's not to say everyone you know needs to be on a ketogenic diet but it does provide a place to start from uh, because it it represents kind of the 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 optimal you know flow of fat in the body and the most efficient um, you know state the body can be in to burn fat at a at a peak rate and then people can add carbs in from there um, carefully uh, to a point where they can tolerate them and uh, and that really does vary from person to person. Um, and many people, you know, enjoy the state of nutritional ketosis so much they they prefer to stay there chronically and and, and over you know long periods of time. But again, that's not to say everyone needs to stay in that you know state of ketosis long term. But it certainly is a safe and and for some folks uh, a preferred state to be in. Uh, you know, the other point I would make is, um, it, you know, even within a person, your level of carb tolerance can vary over time. Uh, most people become more carb intolerant as they age. So, you know, you may be able to eat just a couple hundred grams of carbs in your 20s, but by the time you reach middle age, in your 30s and 40s and, and beyond, uh, as your carb tolerance gets worse, you may find that the same level of carb intake results in you being pre-diabetic or even diabetic. So you have to adjust your carb intake as a function of age or other lifestyle factors. If you're less active, you may uh, require less carbs and, and not be able to tolerate the same level of carbs. So uh, even within a person, this becomes a bit of a moving target that you constantly have to, you know, experiment and monitor and 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 really find that level of carbs that works best for you. And that's that's at the crux of really personalized nutrition in my mind. I mean, this is there's a lot of complexity in how you personalize a diet for someone, but I would say the most fundamental piece of that is finding the right level of carbs that you can tolerate. And in your experience, Jeff, with with personalized nutrition and, and specifically as it pertains to to low carb. Um, have you seen people do better with a more data-driven analytical approach, whether it's, you know, uh, monitoring their blood glucose levels um, and, you know, sort of understanding the impact that different amounts of carbohydrates have on them by, by looking at the data? Or, or have you seen people have success with this, uh, you know, kind of going on feel, uh, lowering their carbohydrate or even going cold turkey, as you suggested, and then sort of slowly implementing carbs uh, back into their diet and, and just kind of monitoring how they feel uh, based on the level of carbohydrate they're consuming or and maybe the answer is you know different yeah. strategies work for different people but how do you sort of um, look at those two different options well another great question and, and this is one of the challenges um, in the field but it's also a really exciting area with all the whole uh, quantified self and all the you know the technology out there the different wearables that can provide feedback I, I'm, I'm quite um, hopeful that you know in the future we'll have a lot better objective information to be able to make these decisions on so I, I do like you know the idea of feedback but um, uh, you know having uh, feedback on glucose uh, you know it, it may not be sensitive enough um, that to to really provide uh, the feedback you need to you know really titrate your carbs to the right level I will say, you know, in terms of implementing a ketogenic diet, um, it's highly beneficial to have regular measurements of ketones because they are very sensitive to the level of carbs you're consuming, and having that that 
regular feedback to know if you're actually in a state of ketosis is very helpful, uh, very empowering for folks to know. Because a lot of people may be restricting carbs um, adequately and think they're in ketosis, uh, but they might be consuming too much protein, for example, and they don't know that um, unless they're actually measuring their ketones. And then, you know, you ask them to drop their protein five or ten grams and suddenly their ketones shoot right up and they feel a lot better and respond a lot better. And and they don't necessarily know that, you know, if, unless they're actually measuring ketones. So it works well, um, you know, on the ketogenic diet. But unfortunately, you know, we don't have a lot of good biomarkers for, you know, low-carb, non-ketogenic diets um, to know. And you do kind of have to go by feel, but, you know, feel going by some sub these subjective feelings can be a little dangerous too because, you know, carbs elicit a lot of, of responses, biochemical responses in the body that, um, you know, can drive binges, for example, and things. These are real. I mean, these are uh, biochemical, hormonal, neuroendocrine responses that are driving um, behavior may and not necessarily in a good way. And Jeff, I know um, you know you, you did a great job there, of course, differentiating between a ketogenic diet and and what we're terming to be the, the low carb diet. Um, and you know today for this discussion, we certainly wanted to focus more on low carb than low carb, excuse me, than the ketogenic diets. But while we're on the topic, uh, just a few questions. Um, what do you recommend in terms of how people uh, measure their ketone levels? Is there a preferred uh, technology or or method that you feel works best? Well, right now, I, I think the best technology out there are the glucometers that can measure ketones from a finger stick, so essentially measuring capillary blood. Uh, you know, there's a couple um, companies that, that have glucometers that accept um, strips that measure the primary ketone beta-hydroxybutyrate, and that's the most accurate way to do it. Uh, you know, the urine strips are, are probably the cheapest uh, and many folks are familiar with that. Um, the problem with, with urine ketones is that the kidneys adapt to a ketogenic diet um, over a couple weeks or months. Uh, and, and what happens in most uh, folks is they uh, initially, when they're uh, on the ketogenic diet, the ketones are being excreted at a high level, and you can detect that with the urine strips. But over time, the renal tubules uh, reabsorb more of the ketones and excrete less in the urine. And that makes sense, you know, the body's perceiving these ketones as actually valuable metabolites, and so it's adapting to keep more of them in the body. And in that way, the urine doesn't necessarily reflect then um, what the true level of ketosis is. So you get a lot of false negatives in that, and, and, and folks who've been on a ketogenic diet for a while. So the blood is preferred over the urine. Uh, I am intrigued by some of the breathalyzers out there that are measuring acetone uh, because that does correlate more highly with blood levels. And uh, acetone is a byproduct of, um, of, ketone, of ketones uh, breakdown. So it does um, provide a, an accurate assessment of the level of ketosis. And there are some companies coming out with uh, breathalyzers that uh, I think are going to be promising um, technologies, but right now I prefer the the finger stick. And you know, it's a immediate value. You get real time, and you know exactly what your blood levels are um, at any given time. Going back though, Jeff, to the um, to more of the lower carbohydrate diet, where people are still consuming some level of carbs. Um, what are the most common challenges you find that people face? when transitioning to low carb and uh, you know perhaps as part of that question um, are there any uh, you know one two or three really common mistakes you make pe you see people make where, where they you know think they're doing what's correct to support a low carb diet but it actually may be sabotaging their efforts yeah I think uh, there are uh, some common mistakes that a lot of folks make one you know one is not really getting comfortable with fat um, you know when you're on a low carb diet you know, fundamentally, your your body's switching over uh, to burning primarily fat for fuel, and so the you know you actually need fat in your diet um, to provide that fuel. It also provides satiety. Uh, you know, fat being the most satiating macronutrient, 
Um, and so people run into problems when they try to restrict both carbs and fat. In essence, they you know they end up over consuming protein. So that 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 really doesn't work out to be a sustainable approach, uh, and they're missing out on you know the other um, functions of fat in the diet. So I think one is you know just being comfortable with fat, and and, eat, and that includes um, saturated fat. Um, you know monounsaturated and saturated fats are really the preferred fats on a low carb ketogenic diet, um, and so um, you know you actually want fatty meats uh, because you need the fat. Um, and and so choosing lean you know sources of protein um, is not really the way to go. Um, you know I, I, other common mistakes with um, especially the ketogenic diet is, um, is 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 in the area of minerals in particular sodium. Uh, you know most of us have been told sodium we need to get our sodium down uh, because of blood pressure and other reasons. Uh, but the you know, the current research on sodium uh, is actually really fascinating because it, it's actually showing moderate to high levels of sodium actually are associated with less morbidity and mortality unless you get into really high levels, um, you know, over seven or eight grams per day, and even really low levels are also associated with higher risk of morbidity and mortality. So it's kind of an, this inverse U-shaped curve. But there's a you know a special need for sodium on a ketogenic diet because the kidneys excrete more sodium, and and you need to compensate for that. And if you don't, you end up with a lot of side effects that uh, you know acutely include fainting and just being tired. Uh, and it's because you have a lower plasma volume because you're losing sodium and you lose fluid with that. Uh, and so it actually becomes very important to consume an extra gram or two of sodium to compensate for that increased uh, loss of sodium on a ketogenic diet. It's called the naturesis of ketosis, and uh, and and that's a common mistake people make because they're you know in addition to being afraid of fat, they're also afraid of overconsuming sodium. But the m truth of the matter is, you actually need both saturated fat and sodium on a ketogenic diet to you know to really make it work and 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 avoid side effects you know the 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 whole struggle of managing energy levels i've i've heard you term this as you know people going through uh perhaps when they're first starting on a low carb diet and lowering their carbohydrate intake um the low carb flu uh, i've i've heard you call it that um i i guess what's the theory why why do people struggle with energy levels when they're first going low carb and and just overall from an energy standpoint i guess coming back to that previous question like what are some things that that just some common mistakes that people might make that are negatively impacting their energy levels well that atkins flu and a lot of those side effects i just mentioned they are they are really linked to sodium 9 times out of 10 um, you know you get people to consume broth or bouillon or you know, and, uh, somehow you know, get more sodium. Those those side effects go away. Um, but even in in folks who are following what I call a well formulated ketogenic diet, so they're getting adequate sodium, they're eating the right types of fat, and so forth. Um, you know, there there's it still requires time for the body to you know basically um, change its metabolic machinery um, to be able to burn fat uh, because people are you know coming to this diet being you know having eaten a lot of carbs and their bodies are are you know basically adapted to you know trying to deal with that carb load and 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 they've inhibited their body's ability to burn fat so when you try to change that you know fuel use over you've got to increase the number of mitochondria you've got to increase uh, oxidative enzymes uh, there are structural um, Changes that need to take place, and that takes that takes time. And and this is especially true for athletes, um, you know, wh who are actually you know sort of pushing their bodies further. Um, they need at least a several weeks, you know, in order to build up their body's ability to burn fat. And this is just part of the process of what I like to call keto adaptation. Um, and we you know, we think it takes you know three or four weeks to kind of fully kick in. But um, you have to appreciate this is not, you know, we're not looking at just one single thing. We're talking about uh, changing a person's physiology in a very robust way. So, I mean, we don't know exactly what the time course is, but in a lot of athletes, 
um, there it takes them three or four weeks in order for their performance to get back to normal and then usually it, they can go beyond where they were prior to that um, and and we haven't really you know formally studied the time course of these adaptations but that's a typical time frame that you know an athlete needs to understand the first week is going to feel awful for a lot of athletes in particular their performance is going to go down and we we definitely um, tell athletes don't try to go out and do the same volume of training the first week because you're going to be very frustrated and feel awful and probably not want to continue the diet so cut your cut your exercise in half and give your body time to adapt and ease into it and um, you know, and by three or four weeks, you should be feeling back to normal and usually much better. Um, and then it just goes from there. And you know, I think that last part of what you just said, Jeff, is is perhaps something I, I know you've probably heard this um, time and time again. But but there's sort of this notion that as an athlete or, or you know somebody who's training or exercising, you know, just this accepted notion that you need carbs, you know, and if, if you want to train hard, you need carbs. Uh, but but you're actually telling us once you go through this um, sort of adaptation period, um, you can actually get to a level where your performance can can improve. So when you're posed with that um, sort of idea that that athletes and people training need carbs, um, I mean, what's what, what's your response and, and what has, you know, some of the research shown um, to sort of support that athletes uh, can have success training on a low-carbohydrate diet? Yeah. Well, a lot of this, you know, just from a basic science perspective, um, you know, there's there's no essential carbohydrate. I mean, if you, again, you look at the way humans evolved, um, humans prefer to burn fat for fuel. Um and that's why we can store vast amounts of fat in adipose tissue. Um, we didn't evolve to be able to store a lot of carbohydrate. Uh, we can only store a couple thousand kilocalories as carbs. So the body prefers to burn fat, and uh, and that's just the way we evolved. Um, you know, and 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 so athletes, um, you know, when you eat carbs, because we can't store them in appreciable amounts, the body prioritizes burning them. So if you're a carb-based athlete, um, the more carbs you eat, the more you become dependent on carbs because you're uh, simultaneously impairing your your ability to burn fat. And so to kind of break yourself of this dependency, you know, you have to consume a diet that's restricted in carb for a long enough period of time where your body can adapt to using that fat for fuel. And that's you know, that's kind of the key is giving the body enough time. And this is where, you know, the research on high carb diets being optimal for athletes failed to ever consider this adaptation period. They would do experiments and put people put athletes on low carb diets for three days and measure performance and of course it went uh, you know, it tanked, it went it went way down. And and you know, it's no surprise because they didn't, you know, give enough time for adaptation. Uh, and now when you look at athletes who have gone through this longer adaptation period, uh, you're seeing many examples of, of you know, not just being able to finish races, but pe the athletes are winning races and setting course records. And so it's clearly um, possible to, to have high levels of, of performance with low-carb diets. And, uh, and there's, you know, a lot of testimonials, a lot of anecdotes out there of you know real athletes um, achieving some pretty remarkable feats on low carb diets, and now we're starting to um, you know to have some research back that up. But it's very consistent with what we know about metabolism and physiology and biochemistry. And most commonly, you know, whether it's athletes that you've worked with in a lab setting or or, or just in in your experience in general, like why would athletes? Why do athletes um, typically try to go low carb? What what's ultimately the benefit that you find a lot of athletes going low carb are ultimately looking for. Well, uh, I think it's several reasons. Um, you know, uh, uh, one group of athletes that I think you know you're seeing the most traction with is the ultra endurance athletes, and you know it's even varied there, but it, it just makes so much sense for the for these guys and gals because you know they're out there exercising for multiple hours you know, sometimes 10, 20 hours in these 100-mile races. Um, and it just becomes 
very challenging to fuel that type of exercise with carbohydrate. Uh, so it makes an enormous amount of sense, um, you know, to uh, you know to do those types of activities um, in a state where you can really maximally burn fat. So that, that that's pretty straightforward. Um, but I think there's a lot of other reasons, you know, even those athletes and, and other even, you know, sh sh more strength power athletes are increasingly turning toward low carb is it's a, you know, fat's a cleaner burning fuel and there's there's less oxidative damage, less inflammation associated with burning fat uh, because one of the most common anecdotes from athletes um, that switch to a low carb diet is they say they recover faster. And, and so... Um, you know, there's just a a lot going on beyond just the uh, metabolism during exercise of being able to burn more fat during exercise. There seems to be a, just a greater health benefit from exercise. There seems to be enhanced recovery. Uh, you know, a lot of athletes, despite being very active into middle age, develop prediabetes, and that's just part partly just their genetics um, they can't you can't outrun your genetics in many ways so um, increasingly you see a lot of middle-aged athletes turn to low carb just as you know a, a way to not just feel better but to, to counteract their their insulin resistance uh, that that's just part of their natural genetics so I think there's a, there's a lot of benefit it, you know this is the thing about ketogenic diets and low carb diets is they affect metabolism and physiology in, in, in a very broad way. They're not working through one simple single mechanism. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're just a, I would argue, a healthier, cleaner way to eat and you, you, you get physical and cognitive benefit from that that really spans you know, across a lot of dimensions of health. For athletes, uh, we, we used the example of LeBron James a couple of years ago, really going low carb to cut to cut weight in the off season, you know, drastically reducing his carbohydrate intake. How much of that do you see um, in the athletic world with with people employing this strategy to really to get lean in in certain sports? Yes, that, that I mean that's a big reason. Um, you know, are the body composition of responses to the diet. So, uh, you know, if you're an endurance athlete, uh, certainly carrying less weight um, improves your efficiency. And we you know we're seeing this. Um, you know, play out, uh, you know, especially in, in cycling and running where every, you know, every pound, every ounce counts. Um, you know, and the, the, the Tour de France this year, um, both the first and second place finishers were low carb athletes and both had experienced pretty large uh, amounts of weight loss um, after going low carb. And these are already lean athletes. But uh, but just losing additional body fat, even in a lean athlete, can uh, can have a big difference on your efficiency, and and you know and that that translates into major improvements in performance in some of these long-term events. And then for the more strength power athletes, it's it's a you know similar type thing, um, you know losing body fat but maintaining um, you know functional tissue, uh, uh, you know improves your power to weight ratio and. Uh, that often translates into improved performance. So I think this is um, perhaps one of the, the most important effects of the diet is, is uh, you know, the relatively um, relative ease of of fat loss um, that occurs with the diet uh, and improves body composition, and and this translates into you know improved performance in in, in different athletes. So. Um, I would say that's that ranks up there one of the you know one of the primary benefits of the diet. You know, there's uh, as as people think about um, utilizing that low carb strategy uh, from from a body composition standpoint, like you just detailed. Um, you know, in some circles, there's this idea that okay, low carb is good for training. It's it's good when I want to get um, you know more fit or, or get leaner, but. On competition days, um, you know, I guess this idea of train low, race high, if, if you're talking in the endurance world, or, or train low, uh, meaning train on a low carb diet, but on competition days, um, you know, introduce more carbs. Um, what's what's your philosophy on that? Is that something that that uh, you know is needed, or or are people able to achieve you know a, a, this high level of performance, um, you know, without having to sort of uh, introduce a lot of carbs on competition days? 
Yeah, I mean that, that's an interesting uh, application of, of sort of periodizing the carbs uh, in, in, around workouts, and I think there are certainly a number of athletes experimenting with that type of approach. Uh, and, it, and, there, and there's some basis for it, um, you know, just in terms of the basic understanding of, of, of metabolism. But they're really, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to kind of defer um, answering this. Um, with, with any level of experimental evidence because it doesn't exist, uh, I, I would just provide a couple caveats. I mean, if you're an athlete that's following low carb for primarily health benefits, I think you really want to probably limit, um, you know, the reintroduction of especially high glycemic index carbs because they would be, you may get a performance benefit, but it's going to be counterproductive in terms of some of the health benefits. Uh, I would certainly think if you're going to experiment with this and I think it's it's worth you know it's worth trying um, if you if you're more on the insulin sensitive side that you would use a product like you can as your carb source uh, to minimize some of the uh, you know the insulin response and the um, and the and the sort of the roller coaster uh, effects of, of of high glycemic index carbs on your glucose levels um, so I think the lower GI, you know, and UCAN is a perfect example of that. That's much more stable in terms of the glucose effects. Uh, I, I would emphasize probably trying the, you know, trying trying this with those types of carbs first. Before we got into UCAN, Jeff, uh, just just one more um, question here. Uh, you know, the idea that that you need carbs as you push the intensity. Uh, what can you say? Uh, about that, it's sort of almost been this accepted idea that that you know when when it's high intensity, um, you know whether it's whether it's a sprint type of race, a 5k or a 10k, or or you know the the end of a cycling race or the speed part of a race that low carb simply can't support that intensity of exercise. Um, is that is that a fallacy? Uh, no, not really. I mean, there there is a, an established relationship between intensity of exercise and and fuel use, and so as you go from low uh, intensity to moderate intensity exercise, you will see fat oxidation increase in a pretty linear fashion. As you go from moderate to high intensity and certainly supra maximal uh, exercise, you increasingly rely more on carbs. Uh, but when you look at the details of that relationship, you can certainly uh, change the relationship in you know, I mean, this, this, the same kind of curve, you know, exists, but uh, you will be able to push out uh, and burn fat at higher exercise intensities the more adapted you are. The longer you've been on a low-carb diet, uh, the more you will be able to burn fat at higher exercise intensities. And we've actually tested this in the lab. So uh, an average athlete who's eating, you know, the traditional high-carb diet will peak at, uh, in their fat burning at around 55 to 60 percent of VO2 max. Uh, a, a, you know, a comparable athlete who's, you know, same body size, same caliber of athlete, but consuming a low-carb diet will be able to, to burn fat or their peak fat oxidation occurs closer to 70, 75 percent VO2 max. So you can certainly push that to the right. And at any given exercise intensity, you'll burn more fat if you're fat adapted. But even in the fat adapted athlete, when you get up to 90% of VO2 max and or beyond, uh, surely you're still going to, you know, rely much more on carbs, and uh, and that's and that's pretty clear. You know, we just can't sustain that type of ATP turnover with fat oxidation. Uh, but um, on a ketogenic diet, you're, it's not like your carb sources and your glucose levels go to zero. Um, you know, you, you actually do maintain normal blood sugar levels, so you have glucose there. And you actually, according to our, um, you know, data that when we studied keto-adapted athletes who'd been, you know, adapted for on on average almost two years, they actually maintained um, normal glycogen levels. They had similar glycogen as their high carb counterparts. This was completely surprising because we we thought they would they wouldn't be zero, but we thought they'd be uh, at least impaired, um, you know, to some extent. But uh, we were quite shocked that uh, 
the glycogen levels at rest and even post-exercise and into recovery were, were exactly the same as their high-carb group. So, you know, we don't know exactly how this is happening. There's certainly metabolic explanations for it um, that we need to follow up on. But it does that's show... Fat. One, yeah, that's Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, it just it does show that there, the body does, over time... Um, uh, adapt to preserve glycogen levels. So there are profound changes in the way the body's managing its glycogen levels, even in the face of very low carbohydrate intake. So, I mean, what that means is you at least have substrate there to do high intensity exercise performance if you're, if you're, um, you know, if, even if you're consuming very little carbohydrate, presumably. And, and so, um, you know, it's not like you can't do high intensity performance even if you're not consuming carbs. Um, you know, your body still has carb stores and, and that are available to uh, you know for glycolysis and uh, and 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 so you can access that 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 high energy substrate uh, in a keto adapted state. That's that's really fascinating, um, you know, and I, I guess uh, yeah, points to the fact that that you, you, what you kind of highlighted at the beginning, where you know a lot of the research um, that that has come out in the last 15 years is really validating a lot of what um, you know what was believed, and then even showing you guys some things that uh, that you not, might not have necessarily known to be the case. Um, with that, Jeff, I just want to transition a little bit into uh, uh, our, our final phase of this discussion, and, and just spend a few minutes on on kind of talking about. You can superstarch from a carbohydrate standpoint, and how uh, it's applicable to folks on a low carb diet, um, and and how they might implement it. And I want to bring in um, Seth Bronheim for this part of the discussion, registered dietitian uh, with You Can. Uh, Seth, how are you doing today? Good, Varun. Can you hear me? We sure can. Awesome. So we got Seth and Jeff on the line. Um, well, we talk about UCAN kind of to, to introduce the discussion. Uh, you know, what's unique about the UCAN product, it's uh, what we call super starch, which is the, the carbohydrate source in UCAN, um, and something that has a, a really fascinating story behind it. As Seth, um, I'd like you to sort of tell folks, um, you know, what the super starch is and what the origins are, and then, um, you know, want to both have you and Jeff comment on some of the research. Um, so, Seth, take it away. What What is this super starch in UCAN, and what uh, really makes it? Uh, have such unique characteristics. So the thing about UCAN is that you know this was never meant for you know people that were looking to lose weight or fitness. It was really actually meant for um, a rare disease. Our founder's son, um, basically, if he wasn't fed every two hours, he wouldn't live. Uh, Jonah suffers from a rare disease called glycogen storage disease. I know we've been talking a lot about glycogen uh, uh, in the context of low carb, and Jonah basically can't convert the carbohydrates in his liver. Um, into blood sugar. He lacks an enzyme and so before the 70s these kids didn't survive infancy and really um, Wendy, our, uh, our founder's wife, she was setting multiple alarm clocks. She was afraid she would miss a feeding at night. Um, so it really was life-threatening and they were looking for a better way. So there was years of research looking for a longer lasting fuel. Uh, so they tried barleys, tapiocas, rices and wheats and what we call super starch uh, was re really meant to help Jonah sleep at night. Um, it was only through accidental discoveries that we figure out that, wow, this could be used to help with athletics, to help with blood sugar management, to help with uh, pre-diabetes pre and um, overall everyday energy. So, you know, um, the ingredient we're talking about here, uh, we call super starch. Um, and we start off with non-GMO corn. That's the starting ingredient. But then this is cooked for over 40 hours with just heat and water. There's no enzymes. There's no chemicals. But the way this is cooked really swells the carbohydrate, so it breaks down slowly over time, dripping into your bloodstream slowly, um, rather than, like we've been talking about on the webinar, the high glycemic carbs that really are flooding the bloodstream at once. So in a way, our super starch kind of acts like a, a fiber that's absorbed as energy in the body. Jeff, uh, your involvement with uh, with the super starch, uh, you know, from, from the research uh, that – I'm showing on the screen here comparing our super starch, the red line, our carbohydrate and its blood sugar response versus maltodextrin, which is a, you know, traditional high glycemic carb that, carb that you find in a variety of nutrition products. Um, what intrigued you, Jeff, about the super starch um, when you first learned about the properties of it and um, what it could potentially offer to athletes? Yeah, well, you know, my, my concern with 
many people's diets, uh, including athletes' diets, um, was that you know the, the the carbs they were consuming um, are are stimulating insulin to uh, you know to too much of an extent, and and that's the real problem um, because insulin is the primary hormone that blocks their ability to break down and use fat. Uh, and I've always been of the belief that um, you know the most efficient way to counteract that is to reduce the total quantity of carbs, and I still think that's the most in, you know effective way to do it. But of course, the other way to minimize insulin is is to uh, affect the or to change the quality of the carbs that you're consuming, and uh, and you know you can really epitomize that strategy, uh, being this slow absorbing carbohydrate. It virtually, um, you know, um, you know, has no insulin response associated with it because it's trickling into the blood uh, at such a slow pace, and so you, you know it 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 does provide a source of glucose, but uh, you don't see the insulin response that would impair fat oxidation. So, uh, you know, that's what really intrigued me was that you could have a carb source that um, could displace other high glycemic index carbs in a person's diet that would allow them to uh, you know, be able to maintain their blood sugar without impairing their ability to burn fat. Jeff, you've looked at, you know, over your years, uh, hundreds of, of different supplements and nutrition products. Um, from a carbohydrate uh, and fueling standpoint, how unique is what the super starch offers from both a uh, blood sugar maintenance standpoint, like we see in the first graph here, as well as a, a carbohydrate that elicits virtually no insulin response. I mean, how unique is that um, compared to, you know, the traditional uh, energy sources or, or carbohydrate fuel sources that we see on the market? Well, it, it, it is. It, unique is, is an understatement there. I know of nothing that has the same profile as you can. I mean, clearly there's there's other carb sources out there that don't spike blood sugar. I mean, as Seth said, you you know, you can consume fiber. And, and they they have virtually no impact on blood sugar, but they also don't provide a source of glucose either. So that's you know that's one distinguishing feature of UCAN is that it is absorbed. It actually has four kcals per gram, like other absorbable forms of carbohydrate, but yet still um, doesn't spike blood sugar, and doesn't certainly doesn't spike blood insulin levels. Um, and as a result of of uh, you know actually being fully absorbed, but not you know, not getting this rapid increase in blood sugar. The other, you know, really distinguishing feature, and this is what is exploited, um, you know, in terms of its clinical use in these kids with glycogen storage disease, is you get this prolonged maintenance of blood sugar over five, six, seven, eight hours and longer that no other carbohydrate delivers. It's clearly not fibers or, or um, uh, you know, or other non-absorbable forms of carbs. So, um, you know, it's that combination. And then I guess the third unique feature is it's, it's just this huge molecule. So it has this extremely high molecular weight, um, and that, that really translates into a very uh, palatable carbohydrate source that, um, you know, because it has a very low osmolality, it's hypotonic and therefore very gentle on the stomach. And I think it's just this combination of, unique features that um, I, I, I just have not seen any other carbohydrate that has all of those features. Uh, Seth, I want to ask you from, uh, you know, kind of what you've seen in practice, but Jeff, uh, just from a theoretical standpoint, something that uh, with the properties of super starch, um, you know, how might it benefit um, an athlete on a low carb diet uh, and how might it benefit just somebody, you know, looking to manage their energy throughout the day on a low carb diet? Well, since, you know, since it, um, it's not stimulating insulin. It really doesn't impair the adaptations and 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 burning fat, you know, that you get with a low carb diet. So, it, uh, you know, it is compatible with uh, a low carb diet, even a ketogenic diet, based on um, you know conversations I've had with some athletes that are you know keto adapted athletes that are using UCAN. So it, it truly is a carb source that um, you know that can be incorporated into a low carb diet um, and not impair any of the fat adaptations and may even provide benefit in terms of you know maintaining blood sugar over long periods of time in athletes 
so that really needs to be kind of sorted out um, in ongoing research uh, because that's one area where you can, you know, we do have published studies with UCAN, but no one's really formally studied it in a group of athletes that uh, were on a low-carb diet. But clearly it makes sense, and there are a lot of examples of athletes successfully using it. Seth, um, for, from in your experience, you know, you've worked with personal trainers um, across the country, dietitians across the country, uh, a variety of athletes, whether it's endurance athletes or, you know, power and strength athletes. Um, two questions for you, Seth. How have you seen people most commonly implementing UCAN, um, you know, from a training standpoint? And then how about outside of training, you know, people on a low-carb diet? What benefit uh, are you hearing, you know, in the field um, of people utilizing UCAN in that way? Yeah, so, you know, before I even, you know, get to, get to training, you know, we were talking about the carb flu and we were talking about, um, you know, whether you go cold turkey, um, going into a low-carb diet. And one of the main ways I've seen registered dietitians and personal trainers implement UCAN is as they're transitioning their clients from, let's say, their people were having a bagel for breakfast, um, you know, or, or having, you know, um, a sandwich for lunch, they're you know, they're taking away that carb load. They might have been consuming 500, perhaps even 1,000 grams of carb per day. And the folks that can't go cold turkey, um, they've been using UCAN as a way to transition their energy and their blood sugar. And Because um, if you take away all those carbs at once, a lot of people get severe low blood sugar um, during that, that, that period of time they're trying to get uh, used to a low-carb diet. So people might have your classic, you know, hard-boiled eggs for breakfast and, you know, have more meats and veggies at lunch. But in between meals... They've used UCAN as a way to stabilize their blood sugar and help them actually comply with and adhere to a low-carb diet versus trying to um, go cold turkey um, and having cravings and all types of issues that occur um, as they're trying to adapt. Um, so that's that's really one way. And I know we we're also talking about the sodium issues. And one of the things we have is we you know we were forced to really create a hydration mix and. One way it's been used is as a, as a sodium supplement. We have 300 milligrams of sodium in our um, You Can Hydrate, and people who are trying to get used to low carb and are trying to avoid that carb flu, they're also having extra sodium in their diet, and one source has been our, our You Can Hydrate, um, which doesn't contain any superstarch. It's just a mineral and electrolyte complex that some low carbers are using, actually, to help with this adaptation. Um, so that's really – go ahead, Mark. No, uh, well, no, Seth. So that that, that was re a really good uh, practical example. So one question that a couple of people were asking was, um, you know, the difference between UCAN and uh, traditional resistant starch that's metabolized in the large intestine. Uh, is, I, I pose this one to either Jeff or Seth. You know, uh, how can we think of the super starch as being different from a traditional resistant starch? Yeah. So you know, one of the key things is that just like Jeff's been talking about. A resistance, resistance starch goes right to the large intestine, um, it's not absorbed, and we are actually being absorbed. So we're a slow-release starch that's actually absorbed, and, it, and you know, again, it had to be this way for Jonah, for our founder's son, to, for him to actually keep his blood sugar steady. Um, so, so that's the real difference um, compared to UCAN versus other resistant starches. Um, and then, uh, you know, what, one more, uh, just we had a question we had on here, uh, you know, the, let me see if I understand this question correctly, it says, uh, with UCAN I understand that it doesn't spike insulin, which allows you to burn fat, but you indicated that the cells need to adapt from a glucose burner to a fat burner, um, will UCAN take you from a fat burner to a glucose burner? Um, so I guess he's asking, you know, if you're already, uh, Seth, you, you could comment on this, uh, having worked with a lot of trainers, um, I guess the question is, if you're in a ketogenic state or you're in a fat-burning state, does introducing a carbohydrate like you can, um, you know, sort of take you out of that state? Yes. So the thing is, it's interesting. People have sent me their ketone levels. People have, um, you know, we are we are a slow trickle into the bloodstream, and to, you know, your your body is always looking for a way to get glucose into the bloodstream. So you might be, you know, having turnover from liver glycogen. Um, but we're providing a fresh source of fuel out of the intestine into the bloodstream. And if you are, I guess the question is, is if, if you're already producing ketones or you're in a fat-burning mode, well, you can't take you out of that mode. Is that what the question is? I believe that's that's the question. Yep. Yeah. So you know, so just like you know, Jeff had mentioned, we're a carb that releases slowly that doesn't block your ability to burn fat. So if you're someone who's adapted to a low-carb diet, you've made that transition. Let's say you're on 50 grams of carb per day. And you're having you can um, yeah you know as part of a protein shake or you're having it before exercise especially strength training 
uh, where it's where it's a demanding workout, um, people have been able to stay in that fat burning mode, which has been what's so key about you can. And again, it's because we're not raising insulin, as Jeff had mentioned. Sometimes five grams are. I think he had mentioned you you uh, a surplus of five or ten grams of protein has has taken someone out of out of ketosis. And some people have you know been able to use you can and stay in ketosis. So it all it's so, it's so individual, as Jeff mentioned, which is really what the future of nutrition is. And uh, just for those of you, you know, I know we had a lot of questions about you can, and I think Seth, you covered most of them. Uh, the, it does come in a variety of formats. So the super starch is the the core of the UCAN product, uh, but it comes in you know powdered form in a, in a variety of flavors um, with the super starch uh, plus uh, some electrolytes. Um, we also have it um, the super starch paired with protein as well, um, which has uh, some different implementations. Um, and then we have the super starch in bar format as well. Um, Jeff, just uh, w one more for you. What, what was saying Seth was saying um, you know th um, in terms of what he's seen anecdotally for for folks that are in ketosis. I mean. From what you observed uh, with the UCAN research, um, did that theoretically make sense? Like, is that something that you sort of anticipated um, could be a property of UCAN just based on what the research indicated to you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, based on the very minimal insulin impact, you would predict very little impairment of fat oxidation. And that's especially true if you're using UCAN during uh, exercise when ATP turnover rates are are dramatically higher, your energy expenditures are higher, that, um, you know, the little, um, a bit of UCAN glucose that's trickling in and the very low insulin response associated with that, um, uh, I would be actually shocked if that was impairing fat oxidation to any significant extent. Uh, so that does, you know, explain the empirical observations of athletes being able to stay in ketosis when using keto or when using uh, you can uh, as we wrap this up Seth um, I'll, I'll give you uh, the, the last word just on you can specifically um, for if, in terms of you can um, for low carb diets you know how can we we're looking at it on the screen but how would you sum up you know sort of the application of you can and the properties of you can uh, as it pertains to a low carb diet well I, th I think the first thing is that we've had so many people that have been protein and fat oriented before they work out. They have a scoop of protein and a tablespoon of peanut butter. They have protein and coconut oil. They're very protein and fat oriented. And you know, a lot of them who are trying to do you know um, you know powerlifting workouts, CrossFit style workouts, um, if they you know either add you can to that already, um, or they replace uh, you can uh, they replace the protein and fat combo with just you can, they feel you know very steady energy. And you know, because they're they've already been in such a key fat burning mode, it's almost uh, like rocket fuel for them in that they they can actually achieve the energy they want to. Um, you know, when you go very heavy with strength training and you're doing higher reps, as Jeff was mentioning, you're demanding on glycogen, um, so you can keep your blood sugar very steady for them, and it doesn't impair your ability to burn fat. So, a lot of folks are on 50 grams or less of carb per day, but then start adding in you know one scoop of UCAN just before workouts. That's a key way they've used it. Um, you know, some folks are using it also after workouts with their own protein or with UCAN's protein enhanced as a way to continue the effect of maintaining blood sugar, slowly replenishing those glycogen stores. But again, they're not they're not defeating themselves metabolically. Where in the past they may have had you know uh, some fast-acting carbohydrate post-workout to recover quickly there, and but it's impairing their fat burn. They're now having UCAN post-workout as a way to keep their blood sugar steady and recover without blocking their ability. To burn fat. So surrounding the workouts has been very key for folks who are low carb oriented, yet their workouts are demanding and depleting glycogen. Awesome. Uh, well, Seth, thanks so much uh, for being on here and, and lending some of your perspective on on UCAN and, and specifically UCAN for low carbohydrate diets. Great to have you on and, and appreciate the uh, the feedback. Thanks, Varen. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Seth. Um, so Jeff, as we wrap this up, um, you know, I just wanted to ask you one more. Um, just in terms of the future of low carb diets, what what is currently going on um, that that really excites you uh, about the future of low carb diets? Well, a couple things. Um, you know, I think the the biggest area where um, you know where we actually have some really transformative data is in the area of diabetes. Uh, you know, this is just a huge epidemic, uh, really pandemic, because every every developing country is 
is suffering from uh, you know just huge increase in the prevalence of, of this disease. Uh, but you know, it, it, you know the mainstream medical and nutritional community views it as a chronic progressive disease that you know maybe we could slow it down, uh, but the belief is we can't reverse it and we're uh, showing definitively that we can in fact put diabetes, type 2 diabetes uh, to be specific, into remission. I mean we can actually reverse it such that um, people don't have any signs or symptoms of their disease. Their blood sugars are normal, their A1Cs are normal and we're doing that while um, we're getting them off medications. Um, almost all patients get off insulin or at least reduce their dosage of insulin and many other glucose lowering drugs and they're losing substantial amounts of weight so um, so it's really remarkable and, uh, and and I'm involved in a very large uh, experiment now where we hope to have um, some papers out on interim data and responses in, the, in a cohort of over 400 diabetics so that's on the horizon and it's just super exciting that we um, you know that we're we we have proven really that we ha we have a tool that can combat type 2 diabetes in in in, in at least in most cases uh beyond that uh you know i'm really excited about the research in cancer uh you know the it's a little earlier in in that application but a lot of the basic science and animal studies and smaller human trials are looking very positive that gliomas and perhaps other types of cancer uh, will be very responsive to ketogenic diets and uh, you know and then you know kind of in a similar vein you know there's a lot of exciting work going on in neurology um, you know we've known for over 100 years that ketogenic diets work extremely well for kids with intractable seizures uh, but we're now um, getting some very positive signals in other areas of neurology uh, I think uh, the areas of all, you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease uh, very likely may find themselves amendable to ketogenic diets. But I don't want to get you know too far ahead of the science here because again, it's you know we don't have the large randomized clinical trials yet uh, to comment on those applications. But I I would say definitely stay tuned over the next five ten years. I wouldn't be surprised if um, we have some really uh, provocative studies published in those areas as well. So it's it's really uh, exciting time. That, that's I mean that those, those things that you mentioned uh, certainly you know have have the potential to change change lives for for a large number of people just in in some of the diseases you were talking about and you know specifically to diabetes, Jeff. I just wanted to bring Seth back for a brief moment to comment on the, the first point you made. Um, you know, from a UCAN perspective, there's a lot of uh, fascinating research that's emerged uh, recently on the application of UCAN for diabetes. Seth, what can you share? Um, as it relates to uh, to UCAN and and its potential impact on on diabetes. Yeah, so so UCAN now used in a medical foods formula with there's you know, with 15 grams of of UCAN super starch and 15 grams of protein and um, you know we've actually we've actually shown to steady blood sugar um, compared to oatmeal and um, even glucerna the major diabetic drinks um, with this formula over the course of of, of um, you know testing blood sugar for a few hours. Um, and then, and then recently, you know, there was a, um, a study done at the, uh, the Jocelyn Center with the same formula, uh, with actually 108 subjects overweight um, with um, uncontrolled diabetes, and um, and so again, you know, UCAN is actually showing potential to um, help with lowering A1C levels too um, in this formula, um, and there'll be a formal paper out, you know, in, in the future. Awesome, Seth. Thanks for uh, jumping on. Just uh, wanted you to share that. Um, so before we uh, before we go, just uh, want to thank uh, everybody. Of course, Dr. Volick for giving up uh, more of his time than he bargained for today. So huge, huge thanks to Jeff, and and big, big thanks to everybody on the audience. And I just wanted to share. You know, obviously this is an extremely meaty topic, and we just sort of scratch the surface of it with our discussion today um, and so uh, you know I, I would strongly encourage those of you who are really interested in diving into this and having a deeper understanding of it to, uh, to check, out, check out two of Jeff's books which um, you know he co-authored with Dr. Steve Finney um, you see them here on the screen but the art and science of low carbohydrate living and the art and science of low carbohydrate performance will really give you a, a great deep dive um, you know, into these topics and, and, and certainly deepen your understanding of, of how to have success 
with low carb diets. So, Jeff, just in your own words, uh, what can folks expect to uh, to find in these books? Well, we really tried to walk a fine line between um, writing a you know kind of textbook style, um, you know, rich with a lot of data and and uh, scientific rationale um, with writing a book that was kind of reachable by the average layperson. And I'm not sure if we struck that balance, but, um, you know, there, these really are meant for the, you know, kind of advanced reader who is really intrigued about understanding the rationale and, uh, and application of a low carbohydrate diet for general health. And, you know, the performance book was geared obviously a little bit more toward the athlete. Um, a little shorter too, but uh, very you know functionally consistent with the low carb living book. Um, so I think they you know they are reachable um, to the average uh, person who's got an interest in nutrition. But we you know in many ways wrote the living book for healthcare professionals because no one really teaches these diets to doctors or dietitians or other healthcare professionals. So that was that was kind of the middle ground we were we were aiming for. Well, that's great. Well, uh, and you know, as a special offer around the holiday time, uh, we uh, we are uh, offering both Jeff's books, the, the Low Carb Living and the Low Carb Performance books, um, uh, written by Jeff and Dr. Steve Finney, um, as well as uh, some uh, samples of the UCAN product um, and a shaker bottle, uh, all together as a low carb gift pack. So you can get that um, on our website, and I'll I'll send that info um, in the follow up email as well. I just posted a link to get that low carb gift pack. In the chat as well. So if uh, if you really want to dive into this deeper, if we've intrigued you uh, with our discussion today, and, and if you've also been intrigued by how uh, you can implement you can as part of this, I, I believe page 60 of the low carb performance book there is a sidebar about the super starch and, and why it might be relevant, um, uh, you know, for somebody on a low carb diet um, looking for athletic performance. So you can try all that as part of this gift pack. Thanks so much for your time, Jeff, and uh, really appreciate uh, the wealth of knowledge that you brought to the table. Well, thank you, Vron. Uh, happy holidays, everyone.